once again, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending when you listen to this, the second lesson in a series, the Middle East on the move, forward or backwards. This lecture forms the foundation to understanding the origins of the modern Middle East, reviewing its history following the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the end of World War I. As you will discover, the seed for many of the challenges plaguing the region today were planted just over a hundred years ago. In the first lecture, we looked ahead at the present dynamics of the Middle East and painted two different scenarios for its future trajectory, forward toward peace, prosperity, and regional development, or backwards toward more conflict civil wars and human crisis. In this lecture, we examine the unique characteristics of the Middle East, its global strategic position, and the origins of the many conflicts that characterized the region since its inception. As we mentioned in the first lecture, the Middle East can best be understood by the three words that define its unique strategic, political, and religious importance from a global perspective, oil, waterways, and religious origins. It has become a practice when analyzing geopolitical affairs and especially major wars, conflicts, and humanitarian disasters to first identify who is to blame. In the case of the Middle East, in its violent and volatile history, it is reasonably clear. The colonial powers of the British and French allies after World War I, who carved out the Middle East into a number of nation states with artificial borders and disregard to ethnic cohesions, and by appointing autocratic royal families as the ruling regimes, they may be the first to blame. You would also not want to leave out the United States, who intervened militarily in the region, with regional wars backing mostly opposing forces to topple autocratic regimes and left nothing but chaos behind. It is this history that makes the Middle East and its member nations affairs so complicated. And it is also why understanding, interpreting, and projecting developments in the region are so difficult, especially to us in the Western world. The first lesson in understanding the Middle East is not to apply our own standards, norms, and morals as the basis for that understanding. As in the Middle East, what you see is not always what it is, and what you hear is not always what is meant, especially if you do not listen to it in its native language. This next video focuses on this very point, the need to understand Middle East culture, customs, and traditions. What do they have in common? What can you identify as the characteristics of the American uh, wrong reading of the Middle East? And I would focus it on a bad reading of the cultural dimension. When you come to the Middle East with universal assumptions about political behavior, and you're afraid that if you speak about culture, you will be accused of being racist, then you don't give enough importance, you don't attach enough importance to what to me is crucial in the understanding of this region, namely the differences between the political culture of this region and uh, everything somebody coming from the West is accustomed to in his own, uh, in his own environment. And I would go even further and say that we must be very careful in the Middle East with very few exceptions to look at what we have there as nation states in the Western sense of the term. I think you will find many more elements of tribal societies where the primordial um, uh, element, the primordial loyalties 
are much more dominant than what we usually find in nation states. And I'm speaking not about countries that don't pretend to be different, say, for instance, Saudi Arabia, but countries who do pretend to be different, like Syria or the Palestinians, as if what we have there is a nation state or a nation state in, in being that is similar to what we are uh, accustomed to and looking at it beyond the tribal, uh, the tribal elements. So let's start our exploration of the Middle East, its origins, geographic and demographic makeup, and its idiosyncrasies. When you mention the Middle East to a Canadian or American or European, the first thing that comes to mind are those images of violence, wars, terrorism, famine, and misery. So before we attempt to understand the Middle East, let us not forget that it is also one of the most beautiful regions of the world, the cradle of civilization, and the home of so many world heritage sites. So take a look. The Middle East has an intoxicating history. It's a cradle of civilizations and a beautiful, complicated land that's home to some of the world's most hospitable people. Jerusalem, Beirut and Cairo. The Middle East cities read like a roll call of historical heavyweights. In this land of historical, architectural and all manner of other treasures, it may just be the people who will live longest in your memory along with the privilege of exploring such a fascinating land. This is one of the Middle East's most treasured attractions. And when the sun sets over the honeycombed landscape of tombs, it's a hard-hearted visitor who is left unaffected by its magic. Towering over both the urban sprawl of Cairo and the desert plains beyond, the Pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx are at the top of every traveller's itinerary. The Middle East may be strewn with landmarks left by the ancients, but few carry the raw, emotional power of Persepolis. Sacred to Muslims, Jews and Christians alike, the Dome of the Rock is an epicentre of religious convergence and conflict. It is also home to a gold-plated mosque of singular beauty built to represent humankind's yearning for God. The Nile is Egypt's lifeline, an artery that feeds the entire country from south to north. Only by boat can you appreciate its importance and also enjoy seeing archaeological sites from the water. So now let's start our exploration with a light and musical tour of the neighborhood. and Africa Turkey across the Mediterranean Yes, we call it the Middle East Yes, we call it the Middle East In the next 10 minutes, you will watch what in all of my research I found to be the most comprehensible, yet not too complicated account of the history of the modern Middle East and its creation. This is the foundation for understanding any and all conflicts 
regional and civil wars, and the interplay between regional actors. Immediately after, you will watch a meaningful yet hypothetical analysis of other, more intuitive, perhaps more peaceful ways to have carved the modern Middle East. Of course, it is hindsight, but it sheds light on why some of the tribal, ethnic, and religious conflicts have been overlooked by both the French and the British. Contrary to what most people believe, the Israeli-Palestine conflict has not been going on for thousands of years. The conflict only started during World War I because of British and French strategic interests in the Mediterranean Sea. This was a major trading route. The Mediterranean Sea gave whoever controlled it access to India. The British Empire sought to control the Mediterranean trading route, and for this reason it was necessary to control the Suez Channel. But the presence of the Ottoman Navy based in the Levant was a direct threat to British interests. So the British and the French decided to divide the Middle East into smaller entities and countries to make it impossible for the Ottoman Empire to control them all. And during World War I, they implemented this idea. One of the Ottoman provinces was Ottoman Syria, which included the modern countries of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan and Israel. This province was divided by the British and the French in the secret Sykes-Picot agreement. Basically, these two empires drew a line from between Mosul and Baghdad to Mount Hermon to the sea in the west. The French controlled the north and the British controlled the south. To prevent the rise of any future regional power, the region was even further divided. Long-time French allies, the Maritime Christians, received their own piece of land. The predominant maritime region of Syria was turned into a separate country, and it was named after Mount Lebanon, the topographical characteristic of the region. Now, prior to this, Lebanon had never before existed as an independent state. Its main reason for unity was religious demography. The British were allied with several Arab tribes and clans, and they had made conflicting promises to various players. The most important British ally was the Hashemite people, who were the rulers of the Hejaz region in the Arabian Peninsula. But neither the British nor the French intended to keep their promises, and instead played all the smaller players against each other. And when the secret Sykes Picot agreement was published by the newly established Soviet Union, it caused turmoil for the region. By 1900, the Saudi clan had launched a reconquest of the Arabian Peninsula from Kuwait. By 1925, the Sauds gained control over the eastern and central parts of the peninsula and established the third Saudi state, which would eventually become modern-day Saudi Arabia. So the Hashemites had lost the peninsula to the Sauds. But by then, the British had given the Hashemite clan two new kingdoms, one in Iraq and another kingdom to the north of the Arabian Peninsula. To be more exact, to the north of the eastern side of the Jordan River. The Hashemites were centered on the town of Amman, and this region was renamed Transjordan, which basically means the other side of the Jordan River. After the British Empire withdrew in 1948, this land became Jordan and remained under the rule of the Hashemite clan and their people. But the native people of Jordan were still ethnically the same as the people on the other side of the Jordan River. That's why even today some politicians say that Jordan is actually Palestine because they are the same nation. As for Western Palestine, European Jews had been moving into this region under Ottoman rule since the 1880s. They joined relatively small Jewish communities that had existed there for centuries. This movement was part of the Jewish National Movement, also known as the Zionist Movement. They sought to create a Jewish state in the region. European Jewish settlers raised funds and purchased lands from landlords in Cairo and elsewhere who had gained ownership of the land under the Ottomans. The landlords sold the land out from under the feet of the local Arab population, uh, thereby dispossessioning them. 
From the Jewish point of view, this was a legitimate acquisition of land. From the perspective of the local Arabs, this was a direct assault on their livelihood, as the majority of the Arabs were evicted from their lands. So it began first as a real estate transaction and winded up as partition, dispossession and conflict. After World War II, the region changed again. There was massive immigration of Jewish people after the Holocaust, and they slowly became the majority in the land, and during this time, nationalism had also reached the Arab world. The newly established Syrian state and the nation saw Palestine, Lebanon, and Georgia as part of historic Syria. They saw the Sykes-Picot Agreement as a violation of Syrian territorial integrity and opposed the existence of an independent Jewish state for the same reason they opposed Lebanese and Jordanian independence. Syria saw the population of these territories as Syrians and not independent nations. Nationalism also affected Jordan. After the division of British Palestine mandate in 1948, Jordan took control of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. But there were deep tensions with the Palestinians and the newly arrived Hashemite people. So the rulers of Jordan, the Hashemite people, they saw Israel as a guarantee of Jordanian security against Palestinians. The Hashemite clan never wanted an independent Palestine state because they could have granted it independence between 1948 and 1967. Instead, in 1970, the Hashemites fought a bloody war against the Palestinians, forcing the Palestine Liberation Organization out of Jordan and into Lebanon. This became known as Black September, and it was followed by another war, the Lebanese Civil War, in which Syria actually invaded Lebanon to destroy the Palestine Liberation Organization and Fatah. Because just like Jordan, Syria too was unwilling to accept the concept of Palestinian statehood. So this is where the modern tensions between Lebanon, Syria, Hezbollah, Jordan and the Palestinians come from. And aside all of this, Egypt too does not recognize the Palestinian nationhood. In 1948, the Egyptian army drove into Gaza. Because Egypt saw Gaza and the Negev Desert as an extension of the Sinai Peninsula, so the Egyptians viewed the region as an extension of Egypt, not as a distinct state. A few years later, in 1952, Gamal Abdul Nasser came to power in Egypt. His ambitions went even further. He had a vision of a single United Arab Republic, both secular and socialist. This concept became a reality in 1958 when Egypt and Syria joined hands and formed a new federation. The new union became a threat to Jordanian national interests and so the Hashemite kingdoms of Jordan and Iraq also joined hands and established a confederation called the Arab Federation. But this alliance collapsed in the same year because the Hashemite rulers in Iraq had lost control of the land in a coup by Nasserist military officers. But the idea of Nasser, a united Arab Republic, went even further than just Egypt and Syria. This idea also saw Palestine as part of this union and not as an independent state. And this is where Jassar Arafat had his role. Basically, Arafat was allied with Nasser and promoted Arab nationalism. And key point to Arab nationalism was Palestine. But Arab nationalism did not necessarily imply an independent Palestinian Republic. Furthermore, it is important to understand that Nasser's vision of a socialist union of Arab nations was hostile to the conservative monarchies in the Arabian Peninsula. Nasser intended to overthrow these monarchs as was done in Iraq. So this in turn triggered the Arab Cold War. On the one side you had the Arab Socialist Republics backed by the Soviet Union and on the other side you had the conservative monarchies backed by the United States. In the end, Palestine is at the crossroads of the Arab world. It is critical to understand that Palestinian nationalism did not simply emerge just against Israel. Palestinian nationalism represents a challenge to the Arab world. Syria sees Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon and Israel as historic Syrian lands and claims to have rights to those lands. Egypt follows the concept of Nasser for a united Arab Republic and central to this plan is expanding its territories to Palestine and Israel. 
By following this concept, Egyptian and Syrian interests clash over Palestine, but then Saudi Arabia gets involved because they need to protect their interest against Nasser anti-monarchy concept. And then there is the Hashemite clan in Jordan, which is still very fearful that the last vestige of Hashemite monarchy could collapse under the weight of Palestinians. The direct enemy of Palestine is Israel, but even if Israel ceased to exist, Jordan, Egypt, Syria and Saudi Arabia would immediately clash over Palestine. So the end of Israel does not guarantee a Palestinian state. The challenges for Palestine go well beyond its borders. This was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. Thank you for watching. Sago. A hundred years ago, World War I was raging. At the height of the conflict, the British and the French met secretly in order to divvy up the spoils in the Middle East after the war would end. This became known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and we're about to mark its 100th anniversary. Today, when we look at the Middle East and we see so many problems, many people suggest if it weren't for that Sykes-Picot Agreement, if it weren't for the imperial drawing of new borders and boundaries, the Middle East might be a very different place. All of this begs the question, what if the Middle East borders were redrawn? There's all numbers of ways in which this could have been done. So what if the borders were drawn on ethnic lines? Everyone remembers the story of Lawrence of Arabia and his great Arab revolt. He had promised the Arabs a state. And you know, many of the Arabs expected a single state for all the Arabs in the region. It was Sykes-Picot that dashed those hopes, as well as conflicting promises to others. However, are all Arabs the same? In 1952, Gamal Abdel Nasser overthrew the Egyptian monarchy and Egypt became the seat of hotbed Arab nationalism. That's the idea that the Arabs should have a single state and many of the borders and boundaries should be erased. Did it really work? Well, Egypt tried to unify with Syria, but frankly, the cultural and political differences between Egypt and Syria were just too much. Likewise, at various points in time, Jordan and Iraq tried to unify, and that didn't work. If you go across the Arab world, from Casablanca to Cairo, and from Baghdad to Beirut, many of the Arabs in the various states can't even understand each other's dialects. There's that much difference. If there's one thing in the Middle East, no one is defined by one variable. No one's simply just an Arab, or just a Jew, or just a Shiite, or just a member of this tribe, or just a member of that family. Everyone has a much more complex identity, and it can lead to a rapid division of any polity based solely on ethnicity. So what if the Middle East borders were drawn on the basis of religion? You got the three big monotheistic religions in the region. You got Judaism, you got Christianity, and you got Islam. But who speaks for each? And when it comes to Islam, we all hear about the divisions between the Sunnis and the Shiites, and those divisions don't seem to be coming to a conclusion anytime soon. If you're going to divide states on the basis of religion, well, first of all, what happens to the minorities in any of those religious states? Are they going to have any rights whatsoever, or do they have to move? In effect, would we have a new round of sectarian cleansing? Just think about the Islamic State for a moment. They killed the Shiites, enslaved the Yazidis, and sent the Christians packing. Is that really what the rest of the Middle East wants? One of the other problems with dividing the Middle East on the basis of religion goes back to the confluence of geography and history. One valley could belong to one minority, another valley could belong to another, and the third one could belong to the first minority all over again. So to draw these borders just on the basis of religion would be very difficult. What if the Middle East borders were redrawn on geographic lines? Is there any natural way to do it? First of all, most of the population of the Middle East lives along the coast or they live along rivers. And so what you have when you go across the broad swath of the Middle East are very heavy concentrations of population, followed by hundreds of miles of very little. So let's think about these population centers. You have the Nile River and you have the Fertile Crescent. Well, that's Egypt and Iraq right there. You have the Mediterranean coast. Well, that's Israel, the Palestinian territories, Lebanon and Syria. Then you have all the states that exist in the Persian Gulf. Oman, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. Could there be some redivisions there? Absolutely. 
Here's the thing, if you were going to redraw the borders based on geographic grounds, they'd probably end up looking not dissimilar to what we have now, where you have states surrounding the population centers, and then you have borders drawn somewhere out in the desert simply to divide one from another. What about all those people who say that the states of the Middle East are artificial? Well, to some extent, that could have been true 100 years ago. But is it really the case today? 100 years is a long time. And Jordanians, Iraqis, Egyptians, Saudis, Lebanese, they've all developed unique identities. Even if you were to redraw the borders, would those identities that are based on 100 years of common history, of literature, of language, of TV shows, really go away? The answer to that is probably not. When people study the Middle East, let alone live there, it's hard to emerge optimistic. After all, this is a region with myriad problems that always seem to be on the verge of boiling over. But if the past hundred years have taught us anything, it's that there probably isn't any magic formula. So should the Middle East have new borders? Should a century of Sykes-Picot be put in the dustbin of history? Let us know what you think in the comments, and let us know any other topics you might want us to cover in AEI's What If series. Since its creation, the modern Middle East experienced a number of seminal developments, seminal events that are key to the understanding of the present dynamics and future dynamics of the region. Likely the most consequential was the establishment of the Jewish state of Israel. After the British returned the mandate over Palestine in 1947 to the United Nations, the United Nations offered to partition Palestine into two states, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. The Jews accepted the plan, the Palestinians and the neighboring Arab states rejected the plan and declared war on the newly created Jewish state of Israel that gained UN recognition in May of 1948. More wars ensued in an attempt to eradicate Israel from the predominantly Arab region, the most consequential of which was the 1967 Six Days War, where Israel conquered Arab territories in the Sinai and Gaza from Egypt, the West Bank of the Jordan River from Jordan and the Golan Heights from Syria. Over the years, more wars erupted in attempts to restore the concept of two-state solution were made and failed to this day. ביום שישי, ה' באייר תשח, 14 במאי 1948, אחר הצהריים, באו המוזמנים אל בניין מוזיאון תל אביב בשדרות רוטשילד 16. הם התבקשו לשמור את סיבת ההזמנה, טקס הכרזת העצמאות, בסוד. אבל בבואם מצאו את חצי העיר ממתינה להם. סמוך לשעה ארבע הגיע דוד בן גוריון. כל חייו היו מסע אל הרגע הזה. זוהי זכותו הטבעית של העם היהודי להיות ככל עם ועם עומד ברשות עצמו במדינתו הריבונית אשר תפתח לרווחה את שערי המולדת לכל יהודי ותעניק לעם היהודי מעמד של אומה שוות זכויות בתוך העמים. לפיכך נתכנסנו, אנו חברי מועצת העם, נציגי היישוב העברי והתנועה הציונית, ביום סיום המנדט הבריטי על ארץ ישראל. ותוקף זכותנו הטבעית וההיסטורית ועל יסוד החלטת עשרת האומות המוחדות אנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית בארץ ישראל היא מדינת ישראל ביטחון 
دکتور اسرائیل اینو خط نیم بختی مات یا دنو لیگوت It is important to understand that this overview of these seminal events singles out specific events that shaped the Middle East in the past 75 years without really doing justice to explaining them in the detail that they deserve. This will be done in future lectures when we will review these and other events in greater detail as to how they affected progress in the region. The next seminal event that shook the world and changed our lives forever was 9-11, the 9-11 attack by Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda's Bin Laden on the Twin Towers in New York. This resulted in the United States invasion of Afghanistan and the toppling of Saddam Hussein dictatorship in Iraq. Fast forward to the Arab Spring in 2011, where the Middle East appeared to be rising state by state against oppressive regime in search for social economic reforms and personal freedoms. This movement also failed when, for example, after the removal of Mubarak military dictatorship in Egypt, with a Muslim Brotherhood duly elected successor, the army revolted and appointed a military general, al-Sisi, today's president of Egypt, and a military dictator par excellence. So fast forward, let's take a look at the Middle East from just after 9-11 through the Arab Spring to today. What have we seen? We've seen that autocrats came under popular pressure, had different destinies, Mubarak in Egypt, Assad in Syria, Saddam in Iraq, Gaddafi in Libya. We see that States, particularly Gulf states and Saudi Arabia, that depend on oil to drive their economies, uh, it's drying up, climate change, and everything else that you know about. There's a generational change, especially in Saudi Arabia, with the emergence of a 36 year old crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who has a totally revolutionary vision of Saudi Arabia, the modern Saudi Arabia by 2030. We see the demise, or do we, of non-state actors like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Yes, they have been driven out of the traditional Middle East. They have lost the territorial advantages that they gain in Iraq and Syria, but they metastasized and now operating in areas of the world like Sub-Sahara, Africa, Pakistan, and now uh, Afghanistan. We have a situation with the Iran nuclear deal that the Trump administration exited from abruptly without leaving any ways to monitor Iran's further development of nuclear capabilities. We see the Iran and Saudi Arabia struggle for hegemony in the Islamic world. Uh, we see it play out now less in Syria, but more so in Yemen during the civil war. We see in Iran internal pressure for regime change, not so much from the outside by the United States or any other foreign power, but rather uh, the economy is in tatters the uh, sanctions have really brought the uh, 
economy down to its knees. People are rising up. We see a new situation in Israel after the election. Uh, it marks a change in orientation from the Bibi Netanyahu uh, Trump bromance that took place in the four years or five years beforehand. And then we see the United States who downgraded their priority in terms of intervention in the Middle East. They don't quite have a clear doctrine for Middle East uh, guardianship, if you will. And so all these are the present dynamics that we will review as we go from state to state that are going to affect the future direction of the Middle East. The highly strategic nature of the Middle East, as we said before, is a function of the three words, oil, waterways, and religion. In the next section of this lecture, we will review the origin, location, and strategic value of these unique attributes of the region. From a historical point of view, dating back to time and memorial, we can see that the Middle East has been the most coveted real estate and was contested and conquered by ancient and modern empires. <laughs> When it comes to oil in the Middle East, the Middle East is divided into the haves and have-nots. Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Iraq and Iran are the haves, and others like Israel, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and Lebanon are the have-nots. Saudi Arabia, of course, is the founder of OPEC, the Oil Producing Economic Council that pretty much controls the supply and price of oil by shutting down or powering up production and manipulating or having the ability to manipulate the supply and demand balance on a global basis. We see it today when we go to fill up gas at our neighborhood gas station. Most of Iraq oil reserves are near Kirkuk in the region of the Kurdish ethnic minority, which creates a potential political problem within Iraq. Iran, on the other hand, is under sanctions and embargo 
that pretty well crippled its economy and it depends on oil exports for survival and has only China as the main client that is still buying Iranian oil. You can see how control of oil, supply and pricing could be a lethal political weapon. In the next chart, you will see evidence how the price fluctuation of oil coinciding with major geopolitical events. There is a direct connection between the strategic importance of Middle East oil and the waterways, especially the Strait of Hormuz, Strait of Oman. The 39 kilometer strait is the only route to the open ocean for over one sixth of global oil production and one third of the world's liquefied natural gas. And also traveling by sea, the strait is the only means of transporting goods or people to the rest of the world, from Asia through the Middle East to Europe and to the rest of the world from there. For this reason, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia have proposed building more oil pipelines to avoid the problematic waterway. And why? because of concern that Iran may unilaterally nationalize or block the straits from uh, traffic and could bring the world economy down or start a regional war because the waterway is the lifeline of the Middle East. Just as the Strait of Hormuz, the Suez Canal, is the shortest maritime route from Europe to Asia. Prior to its construction, ships headed toward Asia had to embark on an arduous journey around the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. So you can see how waterways are so vital, not only to Middle East, but to the entire world. In fact, in 1956, you may remember that uh, Abdul Nasser, then president of Egypt, was trying to nationalize the Suez Canal, which freaked the British and the French, who with Israel together started a war to open up the canal and prevent the Suez Canal from being nationalized or being blocked for traffic at the will of Egypt. So you can see the direct connection between oil, waterways, and conflicts. The next two charts focus on the religion and ethnicity profile of the region. In a future lecture, we will learn about the religious divide within Islam between Sunni and Shia. Suffice it to say that they are not only religious opponents, but also political and as it is played out in the Yemen civil war right now, also militarily. The first chart shows in dark green, the predominantly Shia population, mainly in Iran and Iraq, and to some degree in Syria, and the light green, the Sunni population, mainly in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, the Palestinians, and of course the Gulf states, except for Bahrain. The next chart highlights the diversity of ethnicities in the region, historically the main cause for civil unrest and domestic infighting. This chart focuses on the demographics of the region, especially the projected growth of the population in the different Middle East states. You will notice that except for Lebanon, which presently is on the brink of collapse economically and politically, all other growth is proportionally to the rest of the world high. That means 
that the average age of the population will be lower, let's say under 30, which has already and will continue to become a social and economic burden on the host states unless a significant progress is made in economic, social, educational, and job creation reforms. Finally, by comparison to other regions of the world, the Middle East, though it existed and thrived thousands of years ago, is a relatively young region where most nation states were formed in the 20th century, and many of them have the residual of cultural, administrative, and legal systems that are a legacy of them being colonized by foreign powers such as the British, the Portuguese, the French, and so on. As you can see in the next two charts, this legacy has been a burden on most nation states in a balancing act of civil society, religious customs, and what are considered to be liberal freedoms. No study of the Middle East to gain a better understanding of the regional dynamics can be complete without the acknowledgement of two peoples who lost out during the division of the Middle East into sovereign states and remained politically homeless. They are the Kurds and the Palestinians, though for different reasons. In future lectures, we will review the plight of the Kurds and the Palestinians in great detail. Suffice it to say that the Kurds in the initial division of the Middle East between the French and the British were initially awarded the state, the state of Kurdistan. Only after the British discovery of major oil reserves near Kirkuk in the Kurdish territory, the British decided to amalgamate the Kurdish region of Iraq with the state of Iraq and left the Kurdish population now estimated between 30 to 40 million scattered across five countries, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and Armenia. The Kurds and the Palestinians aspire statehood, which has been denied to them. The Palestinians, who number close to 10 million now in the Middle East, are scattered across Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Jordan, the Gaza Strip, Lebanon, and Egypt, not to mention the diaspora. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the most entrenched of the two, has been the cause of many wars, terrorist attacks, and intifadas, meaning revolts, which we will review in future lectures. Needless to say, the region has been a battleground between regional states and or foreign powers and or radical Islamic terrorist organization for almost all of its modern existence. The following chart has not even been updated to include the Yemen civil war, which is still raging and is considered to be the worst humanitarian disaster in this century as well as the recent takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, which, although marked not so much by bloodshed, than by a return to the Middle Ages as far as society, freedoms, and religious practices are concerned. The number of casualties is difficult to even estimate, as the domestic reporting is flawed or non-existence. The number of injured and displaced refugees exceed 10 million by late counts and is growing. It is hard to fathom that the region has an option but to move forward from here. By now it's probably clear that the Middle East is prone to major conflicts, mainly civil or tribal wars. As we speak, there are at least four that are raging in the region at different degrees of intensity. The Libyan civil war involves the Libyan government, aided by Turkey, aided by the EU, versus the Libyan insurgents, 
Russia, Egypt, Emirates, and France, just to indicate how foreign intervention in the Middle East to serve the strategic interest of the intervening, mainly due to oil, has complicated conflicts and made them so entrenched over time. The Syrian civil war is a perfect example of it. The Syrian government, backed by the Russian, aided by the Iranians, plus Hezbollah, a proxy of Iran, versus Syrian Islamic militias, Kurds, U.S., although the U.S. has retreated by now, and Western allies. The Yemen civil war, where the Yemeni government and the Saudis, plus the United Arab Emirates, are fighting with the Houthis that are aided by Iran. And of course, we have the Afghanistan imbroglio uh, now been sort of resolved with a Taliban takeover where the Afghanistan government and the US and coalition uh, were trying to uh, eliminate the Taliban and of course lost that fight. And now uh, the Taliban are in charge, but the ISIS uh, K is still active and fighting both. So that is the nature of conflicts in the Middle East. And we're looking to those to be resolved sometime soon, or the region will descend again into chaos. And if this is not enough, there are still what would be considered minor current conflicts. And it's amazing that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's been entrenched for 74 years is now considered in the minor category so you have Israel versus the Palestinian with Hezbollah and Hamas. You have uh, Israel versus Iran, uh, naval, clandestine, nuclear, uh, and attacks on Syrian, uh, Iranian targets and militias. You have Turkey fighting with the Kurds. You have an Iraq a government with Shia militias in South. Iraq government versus ISIS in the Northwest, although that's been eradicated. Iraq government versus the de facto separatist Kurds in the North, which has been settled to some degree through a power sharing agreement. And then you have the Egyptian government versus the Muslim Brotherhood and other fundamentalists in Egypt. And so these all are simmering and are waiting for a movement in the Middle East to see if it's going to take it forward, in which case the people will support the governments going forward, or if it reverts into conflicts, disaster may follow. So let's summarize. Where are we in the Middle East? We have rapidly expanding population, large numbers of economically idle young men. This is a tinderbox. We have climate change making the region less habitable. This foreshadows potential catastrophes, region forecast to become hotter and drier. Dangerous religious and cultural outlook, high levels of corruption in the existing regime, declining all wealth. Are we close to peak oil? Economic crisis, lack of tourism because of the coronavirus, involvement in local civil wars and Islamic terrorism, high debt levels, migration to Europe has become attractive. And so these dynamics right now are clear and present danger to the existing regimes and may force them to do one of two things. Uh, either to clamp down on the population and exasperate the situation or come to the realization that the time has come for each state to look after the people and move the region forward toward peace and prosperity. So now that we hopefully established a foundation for understanding the characteristics of the modern Middle East, the demographic, political, economic profiles, the conflicts that are still raging 
throughout the Middle East. We now have to look at developments as they occur on a day-to-day -day basis and ask ourselves, is the region moving forward or is the region moving backwards? And based on the list of events that you will see in the next few charts or the next few uh, clips from news that are taking place as we speak, you will see that it's hard to determine, but at least you will have hopefully a foundation to interpret and understand the root causes of these events and how they may affect the Middle East trajectory going forward or backwards. Congratulations. You have now completed Understanding the Middle East 101, and it is now time for the final exam. The next 11 slides will pop up one after the other in 10 second intervals. The question for each one is simple. So what? In your mind, or if you care to jot it down, try to answer the question with a single sentence. Do not hand in your answer. It is between you and yourself. But if you have trouble answering the question, do not be shy to ask me as if I know. Our postgraduate program starts next week. So now that you've earned your bachelor's degree in Middle East Studies, you may ask yourself, uh, how much of this do I need to remember? Isn't it too complicated? And frankly, do I really care? Now, this is an individual choice, of course. But to help you out, we need to remind you that uh, five years after students graduate university, there are only a few things that they do remember. And so to help you, uh, we offered you the five minute Middle East University. On this next chart, you will see the different countries in the Middle East. And in bullet form, the three or four things that you need to know or remember when you uh, look into developments that affect these countries and the region. And for that reason, we're also offering you a video that stresses the significance, the importance, and the practicality 
of the Five Minute University for your entertainment. I find that education, I think it don't matter where you go to school, Italy, America, Brazil, it's all the same. It's all just a memorization. And it don't matter how long you can remember anything, just so you can pair it back for the test. And I got this idea for a school I would like to start, something called the Five Minute University. <laughs> and the idea is that in five minutes, you learn what the average college graduate remembers five years after he or she's out of school. <laughs> Would the cost of like $20? <laughs> that might seem like a lot of money, $20 just for five minutes, but that's for like a tuition, <laughs> cap and a gown a rental, <laughs> graduation a picture, snacks, everything, everything included. You know, like in college, you have to take foreign language. Well, at the Five Minute University, you can have your choice. Any language you want, you can take it. Say if you want to take Spanish, what I teach you is, como esta usted? That means, how are you? And the answer is, muy bien. Means very well. And believe me, if you took two years of college Spanish, five years after you're out of school, como esta usted, muy bien, about all you're gonna remember. <laughs> So in my school, that's all you learn. You see, you don't have to waste your time with the conjugations, vocabulary, all that junk. You just forget it anyway, now what's the difference? Economics, supply, and demand. That's it. Business, business is you buy something and you sell it for more. Theology, I'm gonna have a theology department, you know, since I'm a priest, it's only right. And what you have to learn in theology is the answer to the question, where is God? And the answer is, God is everywhere. <laughs> Why? Because he likes you. That's kind of a combination of the Disney and Roman Catholic philosophies. <laughs> just, it's just a perfect for the late 70s or early 80s, you know? Just a perfect. Well, after the courses are all over, then it's a time for a little Easter vacation. No time to go to Fort Lauderdale. Only lasts for like 20 seconds. <laughs> but what I do for you, I like to turn on a sun lamp, you know, I give you a little glass of orange juice. <laughs> That's the snack part, orange juice. And then after vacation, you know, after you swallow it real quick, then it's a time for the final exams. I say to you, como esta usted? You say, muy bien. Where is God? God is everywhere. Economics is supply and demand. Then I put on your cap and a gown. I get out to my Polaroid the camera, you know, <laughs> make a little snap and flash a picture for you. I give you the picture. You give me $20, I give you a diploma, and your college graduate, ready to go. And I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure, right next door to the Five Minute University, I might open up a little law school. <laughs> you know, you got another minute? <laughs> This concludes the second lecture in our series. I'm looking forward to next week, where in lecture three, we'll begin the process of understanding the present. We will travel to the main players who have the most impact on the future direction of the Middle East and deep dive into the situation in those countries and how they may affect progress in the Middle East on a go-forward basis. Thank you again for your patience and see you next week.